morning. You already know my name. Do you know my real name? It's Simeon Barjona. The Bible refers to me to as Simon Peter. And I am uh, really glad to be here today. I'm a very ambitious person. Really ambitious and very, you know, take it, you know, by the throat and make things happen. You know, you don't want to cross my, you know, path because if you get in my path, I might take you out. Because I'm a very aggressive person. I'm a very passionate person. And uh, matter of fact, when I was talking to your pastor, uh, he needed some help. He was struggling uh, to figure out what to preach today. So he connected with me and he said, you know what? Can you help me? And I said, Pastor, I will take it on. And I won't, I won't take no for an answer. I will do it for you. I will be here. So pastor's home resting. And I came here today to deliver the sermon for you today. I'm a fisherman by trade. I'm a very good fisherman. I'm a very successful fisherman. I love to fish. And my business is a family business. And I'm one of the 12 disciples of Jesus. I've been with him for three years. And he just let me loose for a little bit of time today to share with you my story on the journey with Jesus. As I am here for only a few moments and was able to peruse the city and look, on, look up some things about our world, your world today, I noticed there's a lot of strange things here. I look around and we're in a building I've never seen before. And there's so many lights and so many different things that just blow my mind away being in this world today, in this 21st century. Um, I see outside when I'm there walking from pastor's home these boxes on wheels that people call vehicles. We never had that in our day. And uh, in pastor's home there was a box on the wall when people were talking to me and they called that television. In other words, I see in your world a lot of materialism. A lot of things, a lot of physical things that people try to acquire to get some quality of life. It's very different from my world. We didn't have that in my world. In my world, we didn't focus on the physical things to qualify our success. We focused on the spiritual thing. If you were living in my world, it would be a world uh, where we were oppressed by Roman uh, guards and, and governments and ta heavy taxed on how, from our businesses, and we could never get ahead, you know, uh, to, to make something of our life. Unless you were born into some wealth, you would never get wealth. And coming from a rich her Jewish heritage, you know, we had some golden years behind us. And now for 400 years, we're under this oppression. And so we are trying to figure out how to untap the power that's within us to champion a, 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 a freedom, a a breakthrough through for our political and religious liberties in our nation. And so, you know, these are how our worlds are different. How our worlds are the same is we all are champion life. We all are trying to champion life. We all are trying to make our lives better. We all have that desire. I guess we're all doing it in a way through our efforts, though. And I guess that's the problem. We're all trying to champion our life in our own way, in our own strength. And so I'm here to share with you my experience of Jesus. And one of the things I want to talk to you about Jesus is that, you know, he's a guy that likes to be personal with you. I know you guys aren't able to, uh, weren't able to meet him personally. I was able to, and he loves to talk. He loves to listen. He loves to eat. Matter of fact, I think that's all he does. Talk, eat, and listen. Um... But, you know, in my privilege of being with him, he has showed me a lot of um, things about myself. As I said, I'm a very ambition, ambitious person. I, I go after uh, things with passion and with vigor. I feel that I am uh, a pretty good guy that can make good things happen. But one of my blind spots, one of my weaknesses, I have a lot of insecurities about myself. And Jesus helped me to realize that. I don't know why this always happens, but people tend to distance themselves from me. They tend to move far away from me, you know. They say that I'm a very blunt and honest person. Um, they say that I am uh, insensitive and don't pay attention to people's feelings. But I just, I see myself as a very humble and passionate person about life. 
But maybe, you know, maybe it's due to my um, distance, my disconnect with my father. My father um, didn't get to know him too well. I tend to gravitate to Zebedee, my uncle. And he was the guy that helped me to take on the fishing uh, trade and develop that to, my, to the family business to be a very successful um, owner of that business. And so, <clears throat> so you know, I was, that's kind of how my starting point was. And in talking with Jesus, he helped me um, to understand, you know, kind of what his ministry is about. And when he called me to follow him to be his disciples, disciple, I was like on top of the world. Uh, one of the things we were brought up as a child, we were brought up to learn the Jewish the scriptures, the Torah. And we were awaiting, in, in the scriptures, it taught us that there is a Messiah, a Savior, an emancipator that will come to free us from our bondages, from our political and religious bondages. And here, Andrew, my brother, one day came to me and said, we found the Messiah. And then the Messiah came to me and asked me if, if I wanted to be on his team. And I said, like, yesterday, you know, I was, I was really excited about this. This was an, a dream come true. I couldn't believe it. Now, for you to understand how excited I was about this, I guess if, if to make it sense to you, if make sense of it to you, I'm, if you had someone that was really rich, think of someone that's really rich in this world, that has a lot of money. Maybe, I, I think I Googled up a guy called Bill Gates. You know, say if he approached you, and he said, I will train you for three years, and at the end of those three years, you are going to be on, 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 on the board to run my business globally. Would you not run to that? Would you not be excited and say, yes, this is our chance, this is our time to make a difference in the world? Well, that's the way I felt when Jesus came to me, and he asked me to follow him and to be, uh, for, me, for him to be my master. I was on top of the world. And I said, this is my moment. This is my chance. This is my ability. This is my time to be in something that's bigger than myself and make a change in the world and make a change for my people like never before. <laughs> I was really pumped. And I sh didn't want to mess this up. But you know what happened? Can I let you in on something? I almost messed it up. And uh, I remember one time when Jesus was sitting with us and asking us a bunch of questions. And he said, uh, who do men say, he asked the question, who do men say that I am? And many of the disciples said, you know, your people are saying out there that you are John the Baptist, you are, you know, Moses and, and various great people in our, our heritage. And then Jesus asked the question, who do you think I am? And then something gripped me and came over me. Something was so powerful and, and and I just felt this in my heart, this prodding to say what I, that came to me. I don't know how to explain it to you, but I had to shout it out. And I said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Man, when I said that, you could hear a pin drop. <coughs> and Jesus looked at me and said, Simon, son of John, no one has told you this but God the Father in heaven. Upon this rock, I will build my church. And when Jesus said that, I was just like, man, I arrived. I passed the test. I'm going to be the CEO of the business. I think that's what you guys call it, right? I'm, I'm, I'm going to be on top of this kingdom, and I'm going to help lead this kingdom into its greatness. <clears throat> I was so proud, and I mean, I can imagine those disciples were jealous of me because I impressed them. I impressed my master. Man, I was feeling so fly. Is that the word you guys use, young people? Fly. I was feeling so good about that moment. And then, you know, Jesus started saying some weird things about himself. He was telling me that he was going to die and he was going to be captured. <coughs> and I said immediately, no way. Not with me on your team. I'm, I'm, the, I'm the guy that's going to make things happen. I'm not going to let nothing happen to you, Jesus. Even if I have to die, Jesus, I'm not going to let you die. And then Jesus said the strangest thing to me. He said, he called me Satan. Can you believe that? Jesus called me Satan. He said, get behind me, Satan. 
I said, Jesus, who are you talking to? This is the same guy that you said that would build your church. And now you're, tell, you're calling me Satan. Talk about being on top of the mountain one moment and then going to the bottom of the valley the next. I couldn't believe what was happening. I was confused. I was bewildered. And Jesus doesn't stop there. I told you he likes to talk. He went on to say more bad news about me. He said that I will deny him three times. Now, those of you who don't know what that means, it means that when he gets captured and he gets run through the ringer in how, you know, the trial for his, for his death, there are going to be people that, that are going to see me and call me out in the crowd and say that I am one of the disciples of Christ and I am going to boldface reject that and say that that's a lie. Jesus said, I'm going to do that three times the same night he's betrayed before the morning comes. And I'm, I'm going, wow. This is my master. I'm working so hard these three years to impress him, to let him know I'm ready for the job. And here, he doesn't have confidence in me. On the greatest, darkest night of his life, I'm going to sell him out. Like he says, I'm going to fail. He might as well have told me that I'm a failure. Why would he keep a guy on his team that's a failure? How does he keep people on his team that he knows won't fulfill his work? But that wasn't the worst part. The worst part was what he said to me, said about me, actually happened. I really tried hard to fight it. But when the pressure really came on, and people were picking on me. <laughs> you ever had anybody pick on you and you just couldn't contain it anymore? That's what happened to me and I just blew up and I said, no, I don't know him. I was so afraid. I, I seen what they were doing with Jesus, whipping him and a, 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 a mocking him and it was very dark, very dark place for Jesus and I didn't know if I could handle it. And when they started picking on me, I said, no, I don't know him. And at three times that night, the last time was probably the darkest part of my life. Because <coughs> as I was, the more it happened, the more people were calling me out, the more people were picking on me, the more I got frustrated and angry, even at God. And I rejected Jesus, but I also cursed and, and, and swore that I did not know the Lord. I behaved very badly. I let my emotions get the best of me. What made it worse was while I was doing all that, I looked up and I saw Jesus there. And he saw everything. He saw everything. Oh, you know, it's one thing to do bad and nobody sees you. <laughs> but when Jesus, your master, sees you do everything, it was so embarrassing. When my eyes met his, I saw the disappointment on his face and it broke me was the last memory I had of Jesus before he died. I don't know about you, but it is very hurtful when you know you have unresolved emotions with people that have passed on and you're not able to say goodbye or able to fix the situation or they leave this earth. You can imagine what I was going through when the one person I looked up to and the one person that became my father, both in heaven and on earth, I let down in his last moments. I was broken. But you know, I just thank the Lord that that wasn't the end of the story for Jesus. That death wasn't the end of the story. For Jesus. I thank the Lord that he arose on the third day. You see, before all this, I didn't understand Jesus, but after his resurrection, I understood a little bit more about Jesus. <laughs> and that's why I'm here today to tell you my testimony, how his resurrection impacted my life. The resurrection of Christ opened my eyes to see Jesus that I've, in a way that I've never seen him before. Like I said, I was a disciple of Jesus, one of the 12 disciples. I've been with him for three years. 
And he's said a lot of stuff and he's done a lot of amazing things. But, you know, you've just, you just never seen him to be the guy that will defy death. Just thought he was a regular guy like all of us. Like, you know. But when he defied death, when he came back to life, it, 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 it boggled me. He did the most impossible mission that no human could do and will ever do. He came back to life. It was the resurrection that helped me to see that Jesus is not just a human, but he is God. Hello, somebody. That's Pastor Kevin saying, hello, somebody. He taught me. He, he coached me on what to say here. But, but, but that was, that's what floored me. <laughs> you know, I was, again, I was with him, and while I was with him those years, I never seen that about Jesus before. We saw him as a great prophet, as a great teacher, a great rabbi. This is the way we understood him. And even when I had the revelation of Jesus being the Son of God before his death, I didn't really understand the depth of what I was saying until the resurrection came and it opened my eyes to see that he was God. It's like, you know, when, I was, when, when we were with Jesus before he died, it's not like he walked around and telling everybody and say, hey, I'm God, worship me. Jesus didn't do any of that. He didn't do the things that I thought God would, think God would do, at least the God that I thought would do. Matter of fact, Jesus, what he did most was he walked around and uh, took on the weaknesses of people and turned them into strengths. He took on the weaknesses of humanity and turned them into strengths. He took on his own weaknesses and turned them into strengths. In other words, he didn't abuse his power to get what he wanted, when he wanted, how he wanted it. Rather, he allowed people to say things to him and mock him and, and do all these things to him, and he just showed love to them. This didn't, this didn't make sense. This is not the way I understand God. But the more I see the resurrection now and what it means to me, is that the resurrection definitely explains who God is. Because God is a God that takes on people's weaknesses to bring them strength. God takes on people's weaknesses to bring them strength. Remember I told you the last moment that I saw Jesus was before he died and we connected eyes and he saw me at my worst. He saw me at my ugliest. And that's the last time I saw Jesus. You know what I think he did? He took that vision of me being at my worst and he brought it to the cross and he destroyed it. <laughs> he took my failures and brought it to the cross and he destroyed it. He took my sins and brought it to the cross and he destroyed it. But that wasn't the end of Jesus. He came back for me to bring me my strengths. <laughs> He saw me at my worst, took it to the cross, and destroyed it, rose again, and came back to me to bring me my best. That is what the resurrection did for me. When I was at my worst, I was lonely. I was despondent. The disciples disowned me. My family disowned me. My friends disowned me. People disowned me. But when I was at my worst, Jesus came back for me. Hello, somebody. When I was at my worst, Jesus didn't reject me. He didn't push me away, but he came back for me. And this is what the resurrection showed me, that Jesus is not just God, but it's God who came back for me. Now, when, this, when I first got the news about the resurrection, it's, it, you know, it wasn't like I understood all what I'm telling you right now in one shot. It took a while for me to figure this out and, and for the Lord to help me process through this. Um, I remember um, them telling me that Jesus arose, and so I got up immediately, and I went to the tomb, and I found it was empty. And there was only Jesus' linen uh, clothes and his, and his um, hat that was on the stone. And my right, my brother Andrew was there, and, and we were just shocked and, and amazed. We didn't know what to think. It was, it was mind-boggling. And then a few days later, we're all in a room just kind of huddling with the disciples, and there Jesus shows up in the midst of us. 
And he shows himself to about 11 of us. And we were like, what? You know, what's going on here? And he starts breaking bread and giving us the Lord's Supper and then vanishes once it's done. And I was told that there was about 500 different appearances that Jesus showed himself to being a risen from the dead. There were some amazing things happening. But you know what? As amazing as this good news was at first, I still wasn't uh, ready to follow him again. I, you know why? Because I remember the last time I saw him, I was at my worst. And I knew that I messed up big in front of him. And I didn't know how to face him. I didn't know what to say to him to make things better. You ever said something in a relationship and when you say it, you kind of wish you didn't say it and now you don't know how to face the person to fix it? Well, that's the way I felt. I was, I was you know, not as engaged as I was uh, before in the things of God after I failed him. <laughs> Um, when I went to the synagogues, rather than being up at the front of the church to get everything from it, I stayed at the back. Matter of fact, I didn't do much synagogue going. I kind of stayed by myself. But when I did go, I wasn't as engaged. I didn't get involved in different things that Jesus would have had me involved with to help the community. I kind of just went back to doing what I was good at. Because who wants to be a failure? Jesus said I was going to fail. I ended up failing him. So why bother keep doing something and failing? I might as well do something that I'm good at. And I'm an ambitious person. I don't waste time with failure. If I'm not good at something, I find something else to do so I can make a difference. You know what I ended up doing? I went back fishing. My successful business. And I started to do more of that and just dig myself into that. But how many people know that when you walk away from God, God is not going to let you walk away from him. One morning, early morning, I was out all night and we couldn't catch any fish and, and Jesus, the resurrected Lord, came by and he told us who were struggling all night, he said, put the, the nets on the other side of the boat. And man, when we make the, the adjustment to, to do that, we didn't know who it was at first, but he was telling us to do it, but when we made that adjustment, we moved our nets to the other side, we had an amazing catch. Normally, we fish at night. That's where the catch is because the, the fish can't see the nets. But this was morning, and I don't know if we were going to catch anything. But when we made the adjustment, man, did we catch fish that way. And I remember that happened one time before, and it got me thinking, this is not just any man. This is Jesus calling us. And so as soon as, soon as uh, we knew it was Jesus, I got my clothes on and together, and I went down, and I went to go see, get a little closer to get to see him. And you know what he had us do? He had us eat and talk and listen. And it was a wonderful time of communion. It was a wonderful time of fellowship. It was in this time that I saw Jesus a little different. He came to listen to me. And that was the opportunity for me to tell him everything. Tell him how I failed him. Tell him how I was confused. Tell him how I was angry. Tell him how I didn't know how to fix myself and how I didn't know how, if I had it in me to die for him. I was a coward and I am still am a coward. And I didn't know how to make myself ready for him. You know what he did? He just loved me. He didn't rebuke me. He didn't scold me. He didn't, cor he didn't correct me. He just loved me. He put his arm around me and kissed me and said it was good to be back with him. You know, this is the second thing I learned about the resurrection was that the resurrection helped me to see God in Jesus, but it helped me to see Jesus in God. It helped me to see that God is a God who loves to get close with people. He's not a far and distant God out there busy doing something while we're struggling on earth trying to do our thing, but he desires to get close to us. He desires to know us. He desires to understand what gets us, what makes us tick. He wants to know what bothers us. He wants to know what what you know what inspires us. And 
He likes to peel the layers of ourselves to see who we really are and to let us know that he sees who we really are and to let us know that he still loves us. That's what the revelation did for me. When I was at my worst, Jesus didn't reject me. He embraced me. If I was to leave two things with you on what you can do to champion your life, based on my experience, that, that experience with the resurrected Lord after that fishing, <coughs> a miracle, it would be, the first thing I would say is real life, real life starts with a close relationship with Jesus. Now, remember, I was with him for three years, following him, and I didn't understand that until after the resurrection. I was busy doing a lot of stuff. You know, I was getting religious and I was just doing a lot of stuff to get stuff done. And I figured if I do it, I get stuff done, it's going to make life better for Jesus. It's going to make life better for me. And I missed the whole aspect of building that close relationship with Jesus. I was focused on doing stuff to make my life work. And I didn't realize that when I have a relationship with God, it's going to help my life work. And you know, it doesn't start with me. It didn't start with me. It actually started with Jesus. This relationship that we have with God starts with Jesus. He is the one that pursued me. I was busy going back to fishing, doing my business, and Jesus came back for me. The resurrected Lord came back for me. And he drew me into his love. Oh, glory to God. He, he, I, was, I was indifferent. I was broken. I was discouraged. I was ashamed. But when he came back for me and his love was, was intoxicating, it was addicting. The more he, he showed me his love, the more I wanted it. It's like a baby, you know, that coos in the arms of his or her mother uh, where the mother sings lullabies and kisses that baby. All the baby does is to, you know, the crying stops and the baby snuggles a little more into the mother. That's the way I felt when I was in the presence of Jesus. I felt his warm, loving embrace. I wanted more of it. I wanted more of his love. It was, I felt safe. I felt I could be transparent. It was a good experience. I wish everybody could enjoy. I love being loved by Jesus. It healed my heart. There were some broken wounds, emotional wounds from my past. And, and in that experience, it helped me to love myself and to love people more because I know that there's a God that truly loves me and cares for me. Not from the distance, but I could feel it like a mother holds a baby. That's the first thing. It starts with a close relationship with Jesus. The second thing I would say is that real life ends with a fulfilled mission for Jesus. As I said about that relationship, when we have that close relationship with Jesus, <coughs> and he asked me, do you love me? And I said, yes, Lord. He said, then feed my sheep. See, the more I embraced his love, the more I could hear his voice speak purpose into me, the more I could hear his voice speak purpose and destiny and direction for my life. You see, I thought my life was to impress God was to impress people, to let them see how good I am with what, he is, what I, with what I can do for God. But the more I'm understanding it, it was God's grace that gives me everything to do my work for Him. It's God's grace. It's His love. And it's the more I embrace this love, the more I hear His voice speak purpose into me. And the more He spoke, the lies that I was carrying in my head that I'm not good at this and I'm not good at that, started to switch, and I started to get truths about myself and truths about who I am, and, and I started to be more liberated in becoming the person that God created me to be. And he started to tell me, feed my sheep. And the more he said, feed my sheep, the more it gave me confidence, the more it gave me boldness, the more it gave me the ability to know that I can do this. Before, I was a coward. But as he spoke into me, like light uh, uh, chases out the darkness, it, as he spoke into me, as, as, as he put faith in my fear, it, it gave me boldness to believe I can do it. 
I can do all things because Jesus is giving me the direction and power to do it. Oh, man. <laughs> I mean, it changed me. I, I, I'm not defined by no longer my failures. I'm not defined by the people that hurt me in my past. I'm not defined by the success of my business. I'm defined by the only one who sees me at my worst and who is working hard to make me at my best. <laughs> That's the person. That person is the resurrected Lord, Jesus Christ, who is now seated on the right hand of the Father. That's the person that defines me. So as I wrap it up with a sentence of what am I all trying to say here? I'm saying that God did a mission impossible to make my mission possible. God did a mission impossible to make my mission possible. The resurrected Lord is still here today. He is here. And he is walking between the, the aisles. And he is coming to where you are right now. He's coming to your church right now. He's coming to your home. He's coming to your school, your job, your neighborhood, and he is coming to eat with you, to listen to you, and to talk to you. He wants relationship with you. He wants to have a closer relationship. And I don't know whether you believe what I'm saying or whether you, or whether you don't, but this message doesn't matter about whether you believe in Jesus or whether you believe my testimony or not. What matters is when he is coming for you, all you got to do is embrace his love. Is embrace the love that you may feel even right now as I'm talking. And when you embrace that love, everything else will work out. He's looking past your failures right now. He's looking past your past mistakes. Because he's taking care of that on the cross. And... Also, all we got to do is look past our inhibitions and look past our distractions and embrace it. There, there is, you have no, nothing to lose to nurture a close relationship with Jesus. All that would happen to you is you will gain real life. Well, my time is up. I hope I did a good job today but I have to get back to Jesus and the others um, they said something about waiting for Jesus at Jerusalem until we're endued with power from upon high so I better get back there and make sure I don't miss my spot um, and hope that maybe one day I can come back again to share that experience with you but until we meet again. May the peace of God be with you. Shalom.